Well, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on this beautiful uh, Tuesday afternoon. And welcome to Serendipitous Science with Dr. Joe Schwartz. Um, so happy that you all can join us. And without further ado, I will pass it over to you, Dr. Joe. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. And uh, hi again, everyone. A little bit of a different topic uh, today. Get your mind off of COVID talk all the time. Come back with me for a moment to 1954. I grew up in Hungary and I constantly had trouble with my tonsils and in 1954 they had to come out. And they did. And I remember this very well. The doctor came into the room, took a cloth, poured some chloroform on it, put it over my mouth and uh, told me to count backwards from three and I think I got to two. Well, chloroform was a general anesthetic used in those days, way back in the 1950s. Although it had been discovered a long time before by James Simpson in the UK, uh, when they were looking for various kinds of solvents that you could inhale to put people to, to sleep. Well, today chloroform is not used anymore as an anesthetic because it turned out to be uh, toxic, uh, carcinogenic. Uh, luckily, I used chloroform before it was carcinogen. Anyway, <clears throat> why am I telling you this, uh, this story? Uh, because uh, chloroform is no longer used as an anesthetic. In fact, the only reason that chloroform is used now is as starting material to make Teflon. That's a little aside for you. But uh, chloroform uh, brings back these memories for me of having my tonsils out and after my tonsils came out, I was given lots of ice cream to eat. That was the thing in those days. That's how you soothed your throat after the tonsils. However, uh, my mother had a sister in, in Canada. And uh, after she heard about me having my tonsils out, she sent us a package. And that package included aspergum, which at that time was not available in Hungary, but was available here. And the idea was that you would chew this and this would take away the pain of the sore throat. And therein lies the beginning of our story about serendipity. How so? Dr. Lawrence Craven was a physician in California uh, who had noticed that his patients who were chewing aspergum after having their tonsils removed uh, did better. However, they also bled more. And he had not seen this before. And he wondered whether it was the aspirin in the gum that caused the bleeding. And he was a general practitioner, so he had all kinds of patients, including ones who had heart disease. And in those days, they already knew that heart attacks were caused by blood clots. So he started to put his patients on aspirin because of what he had noted with the aspirin gum. And lo and behold, there were fewer cases of strokes, fewer cases of heart attacks. He had made a very interesting discovery. And uh, pretty soon, this became known through publications to others. And Dr. John Bain in 1971 finally explained exactly what is going on, how aspirin interferes with a, a certain enzyme in the body, and, and that was linked to, to the anti clotting uh, effect. And uh, to this day, as you probably know, many people are given low dose aspirin, 81 milligrams, to take on a regular basis to prevent a, a heart attack. It's not given to prevent the first heart attack, it's given to people who already have some sort of cardiac risk to prevent a, a subsequent uh, cardiac event. But what is interesting about this is that it was a serendipitous discovery because of course Craven did not set out to find some way of uh, preventing uh, heart attacks, but he happened to make the observation and came to the conclusion. And this is a very interesting aspect of science. Uh, sometimes luck plays a, a role. However, you have to have your mind ready to, uh, to know what to do with the luck that has come your way. Way back in the 1700s, Horace Walpole, an English writer, uh, introduced the term serendipity. He was familiar with an old story the Three Princes of Serendip. This was written somewhere in the Middle Ages. Serendip, incidentally, is the ancient name for Sri, Sri Lanka or Ceylon. And this was a really a fascinating story. 
It was a story of three princes who during their travels made a number of discoveries. And uh, these discoveries were made by accident, but they had the sagacity to know what to do with these discoveries. Eventually, serendipity came to, to represent a lucky turn of events, but there's a little bit more to that as, uh, as you will see. Uh, what is sagacity? Well, that's the intelligence uh, that you have to use in order to come to some kind of sound judgment based on the observation. So the moral of the story here is that, yeah, many people can make observations, but unless you have the sagacity uh, to do something with those observations, the observation may just amount to absolutely uh, nothing. So let me tell you the interesting story of how serendipity began. It all goes back to a camel salesman who apparently lost one of his camels and he was looking for it and was unable to, uh, to find it. But these three princes, uh, during their adventures, actually came up with a solution to this rather interesting problem. And when they met the camel merchant who informed them that he had lost the camel, they said, well, yeah, they knew that he had lost the camel and that the camel was lame, blind in one eye, uh, and all of these details, as you can see, carried butter on one side and honey on the other, was ridden by a pregnant woman. And the uh, camel merchant was absolutely blown away by this. Why? Because it turned out this was true. This is exactly the kind of camel that he had lost. Well, how did these guys know about this? Because during their travel, just before meeting the uh, camel merchant, they had noticed some unusual camel tracks on their journey. And they made some interesting observations here. And for example, they saw that on, on uh, one side of, of the road, the grass had been eaten and not on the other side. And it had been eaten where there actually was less grass. So they kind of surmised that the camel was blind on, on one side and didn't see the luscious uh, grass. And uh, they also saw some large tufts of grass. And from that, they inferred that the camel must have had a missing tooth where the food came out of its, its mouth. And uh, because uh, they saw only three solid footprints and one kind of dragged along, they inferred that the camel was lame. And as you can see here, uh, they found that uh, on one side honey had spilled and, and uh, uh, ants gathered there, whereas flies gathered on the other side where the butter must have been. And the pregnant woman uh, had, uh, had to, to urinate and she had squatted and used her hands to push herself up because she was heavy because of the baby. Well, pretty interesting. What does this smack of? Sherlock Holmes, right? Making observations and coming to conclusions. But of course, there was luck involved here in, in the fact that they happened to meet that merchant who had lost the, uh, the camel so that they could reveal their observation. And one wonders whether or not Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the creator of Sherlock Holmes, had ever read The Three Princes of, uh, of Serendip. So now you have a bit of a background on where this expression serendipity comes from. It is luck, but there's a bit more than luck because it is also uh, knowing what to do with the lucky observation that has come your way. So these three princes were able to capitalize on the chance observation that they had made when they heard about the lost camel. Hmm. Let's take a look at the world of science, where this whole notion of serendipity may play a role. And I think it is really opportune here to start with the story of Louis Pasteur, and of course, his classic statement uh, that uh, chance favors the prepared mind. Um, I think we get the idea of what that means, is that many people may make some sort of observation, but never know what to do with it. So uh, if luck comes your way, you have to be able to capitalize uh, on that luck, which Pasteur demonstrated very, very neatly. Mm. Now, of course, we know Louis Pasteur as the originator of the germ theory of disease, which was based on his studies of fermentation. Uh, basically, the French government had asked him uh, why sometimes wine goes sour and, and uh, beer develops off tastes. And he eventually figured out that there were microbes that would contaminate these uh, beverages. And that eventually gave birth to the germ theory of, 
of disease. So Pasteur, in the middle of the 1800s, became very interested in uh, microbes, and especially in whether or not these were linked to disease. And one of the diseases that farmers were very, very interested in those days was a disease called chicken cholera. And it was an infectious disease that was passed from one bird to the next, and it would wipe out whole chicken populations. So Pasteur was interested in finding a way to solve this problem. And he managed to isolate uh, a, a microbe, a bacterium, from a chicken. And he wanted to explore whether or not this was the causative factor in chicken cholera. So he injected it into live birds and discovered that, indeed, this was the factor because the birds died. And he was carrying on uh, with this work, but his uh, holidays intervened. And he had some um, chicken cholera uh, bacteria that he had put away. And uh, when he came back from the vacation, he wanted to continue on with this work and again, try to inject uh, healthy chickens to see whether or not they would get sick. And believe it or not, they did not. They kept on leading their happy life. Most people would have thought, gee, you know, there must have been something wrong with that original batch. That must not have been what killed the chickens, because why wasn't it doing it again? But Pastor thought about it and thought about it, and he thought that maybe something happened to those microbes, to those bacteria, in the intervening time. And exactly that was the case. When these bacteria were left for a few weeks, their composition changed. They the term is that they attenuated, they became less active, less active. But when they were injected into the, uh, uh, into the chicken, uh, the chickens survived. But then Pasteur, of course, wanted to see what is going on here, and he injected those chickens again with some new live bacteria, and the chickens survived. So he concluded that the bacteria that had been attenuated, that had been left in the laboratory for a few weeks, somehow protected these chickens from the live bacterial injection. And this was the birth of, of the vaccine against chicken cholera. And Pasteur, of course, is regarded as one of the fathers of uh, immunology based upon this uh, experiment. The uh, uh, quacks got into the game very quickly, as they very often do. And as you can see, this chicken cholera powder was sold to humans as well to treat cholera, diarrhea. And of course, uh, chicken cholera was a totally different disease from uh, human afflictions. Uh, so this did not do anything at all. But the bacteria that uh, Pasteur had discovered uh, is named after him to, to this uh, very day. But it's interesting uh, discovery. And uh, we talk about it as a serendipitous one because had he not gone away for the vacation and left those uh, culture dishes in the lab uh, for the bacteria to change to attenuate, he would have never made this discovery. But of course, his mind was prepared, and he knew what to make of this observation. And he recognized that somehow something happened to those bacteria in the uh, vacation period, and he was able to capitalize uh, on this. Mm. A similar discovery was made by Alexander Fleming in 1928. And of course, uh, this is uh, a story that uh, virtually every child learns in school, his discovery of penicillin. And uh, by this time, of course, the germ theory of disease had been well established. And uh, Fleming was trying to find substances that could kill bacteria. And uh, he was working in his lab. And again, he went away for a very short vacation. Vacations have played an important role in science. He went away for a very short vacation, and he left his bacterial culture dish in the lab. When he came back, he found mold that was growing in this culture dish. Now, many people would have just looked at that and said, gee, you know, I got to start this experiment over again, seeing this moldy culture and thrown it out. But uh, he looked at it very carefully. And he noticed that around the periphery of the mold, the bacteria had died. So he figured that this mold must have been producing some substance that killed bacteria. 
Well, Fleming was never able to isolate what that substance was, but he did make this critical original observation. And that, of course, triggered a great deal of research. And eventually, Howard Florey and Ernst Chain in England, about 10 years after Fleming's discovery, managed to isolate the active ingredient that the mold was making. And that ingredient, of course, came to be known as penicillin. Uh, it became a wonder drug. Uh, during the Second World War, it's, it saved numerous lives. Uh, infection, of course, is a byproduct of war. Obviously, many wounds get in infected. And unfortunately, gonorrhea is also a byproduct of war. And penicillin cured that as well. So within 10 years of the discovery, penicillin began to be manufactured, introduced. And it's not surprising that in 1945, uh, Chain and Florey shared this Nobel Prize with Fleming. Now, they never worked together. Uh, but if it had not been for Fleming's original observation of the bacteria dying around the, the mold, then, of course, Chain and Florey would have never carried on their work. So this was a very well-deserved uh, uh, Nobel Prize. And penicillin today, of course, is, is still produced in large volumes. It is made through a process of fermentation in these gigantic vessels where uh, the mold is fed uh, mostly some sugar and it digests the sugar and converts it into uh, penicillin through the process of fermentation. Fermentation is a term that is uh, very often used even in everyday language, uh, but uh, most people don't really know what, what it means. Uh, in a fermentation process, some living organism generates uh, uh, enzymes, and those enzymes, which are biological catalysts, can convert one organic compound into the other. The classic example of fermentation, of course, is alcohol, where uh, microbes uh, uh, secrete an enzyme that converts sugar into ethanol a classic example of, uh, of fermentation. Now, of course, not all diseases are caused by uh, bacteria or by uh, viruses. There are all kinds of diseases out there. And in many of these, again, luck or serendipity has played a role in finding a solution. For example, malaria. The term malaria comes from the Latin for bad air. It was believed that uh, this was transmitted by polluted air. Well, of course, we know that this is, uh, is not the case. Uh, we know today that malaria is a, a parasite that is transmitted by the bite of a mosquito. And uh, indeed, it is the female mosquito that, uh, that bites and uh, transmits this uh, uh, parasite. And it still kills millions of people around the world, although today there are medications for it. But the first medication that was ever used for malaria has an interesting serendipitous story surrounding it. And for this, we go to South America and Peru. The Jesuits had come to South America to try to convert the natives to Christianity. And they heard an interesting story there from the natives. Uh, the natives, of course, suffered from malaria. They didn't know that it was malaria. Uh, but they suffer from fever. And the Jesuits heard an interesting story about a native who had been wandering through the forest, suffering from fever and aches, and became thirsty and drank water from a pond in which a very specific tree had been growing. And this tree turned out to be the cinchona tree, and the bark of this tree produces a compound, which today, of course, we know as quinine, which can alleviate fever. So the Jesuits heard about this, and they imported Peruvian bark back to Europe to treat malaria. And uh, the cinchona tree became a, a very important product, a med medicinal uh, product. And unfortunately, there wasn't enough of the Peruvian bark to take back to Europe to try to treat all the people who were suffering from malaria. However, again, it was a chance discovery because it was the luck of this native, if the story happens to be true, which it might well be, uh, of drinking from just the right pond and noticing that a specific tree was growing around that, uh, that pond. Well, today, of course, we know 
that the active ingredient in the bark of the tree is quinine, and it is still extracted from the bark of the, of the tree. It is still used uh, in the uh, treatment of malaria. Uh, however, there are other medications today that are also used. Uh, quinine in, in, in molecular structure is, is quite similar to the hydroxychloroquine that you hear so much about these days. Uh, because of the supposed benefit it has on, on COVID-19, although the, the fact is that the experiments that have been done so far have shown that it doesn't do anything, in spite of uh, Trump promoting this and, and claiming that he takes it uh, himself. But anyway, as you can imagine, there was certainly an effort back then in the 1800s to uh, extract the active ingredient from the bark of this tree and to try to reproduce it. And this brings us to another very interesting and very important serendipitous story. And this is the story of discovery of synthetic dyes. The very first synthetic dye that was discovered was Movine or Mauve. Now, obviously, there had been dyes before the 1800s. I mean, we go back to the Bible and you hear the story of Joseph and his uh, multicolored coat. Uh, obviously, they had ways of dyeing fabric back then, but these were all natural processes so that if you wanted a red color, then you had to know where to find the matter plant because the roots of that plant gave you a, a red color. If you wanted blue, well, then you'd look for the indigo plant. Many yellow flowers can give rise to a yellow dye. So those were natural dyes and they tended to be hard to extract and, and hard to, to work with. Well, mauve became the world's first synthetic dye. And in fact, it was a color that no one had ever seen before. It was a total novel color. Well, let me tell you the serendipitous story of how this one came about. We go back to the era of Queen Victoria. And uh, at that time, uh, although there was a lot of very good science that was being done in Britain, it turns out that Germany was was the leading country when it came to making scientific discoveries. And Justus von Liebig uh, was one of the top German chemists at the time. And he was much sought after as a lecturer. And he was invited to come to England. And he did. And he gave a series of lectures in England. And in one of those lectures, he made this rather astounding statement, not very pleasant to his hosts that England is not the land of science. There's widespread dilettantism. Chemists are ashamed to be known by that name because it has been assumed by the apothecaries who are despised. And indeed in England today, uh, pharmacists are still called uh, chemists. Now, of course, uh, Liebig wasn't really correct about dilettantism in England. I mean, after all, England had produced uh, the likes of uh, Newton and uh, Faraday and uh, John Dalton and Humphrey Davy. Uh, so uh, it's not like Eng England wasn't producing scientists. But Germany uh, really was doing super research at that time. And uh, Prince Albert, who was Queen Victoria's husband and was of German descent, wanted to capitalize on German knowledge. And uh, he wanted to import top-notch German scientists to England to kind of lubricate British science. And he asked August Wilhelm Hoffmann, who was uh, one of the leading lights of German chemistry in those days, to come to England and to set up what came to be called the Royal College of Chemistry. And this was the first institution in Great Britain ever specifically devoted to the study of, of chemistry. And uh, there were a lot of students who gravitated here, uh, drawn by the fame of, of, of Hoffman. And one of these students was a youngster, 16-year-old William Henry Perkin. He actually was too young to be formally admitted as a student, but uh, he had developed a love of chemistry. He had just read about it himself. And in those days, of course, there wasn't all that much to read. So it's quite interesting that he became so motivated. And he banged on the door and he asked Hoffman to allow him to do anything. He would clean up after the other students. He would wash their glassware. Uh, he would do anything to help. He just wanted to, to be involved with chemistry. 
And I guess he was very persistent. And Hoffman said, okay, uh, you'll help. And it turned out to be very good. And the graduate students started to give him more and more uh, reactions to carry out. And then in 1856, the Easter holidays rolled around and the Institute was to be shut down for a couple of weeks. And Perkin went to Hoffman and said, is there anything I can do at home? Because I don't want to be without chemistry for two weeks. Very, very understandable. Nobody would want to be in that position. And I guess he pestered and pestered and pestered until Hoffman said, all right, OK, I'll give you a little task here. You know, um, we're looking for a way to make quinine in the laboratory. And Hoffman himself had been working with his whole group. And here's the whole group of Hoffman. And they're highlighted as, as, as young Perkin. He had been working with these students. And he, with their help, had already examined the bark of the cinchona tree and they had managed to isolate the white powder from there and he knew what its chemical composition was now they do nothing about molecular structure in those days but they were able to de determine elemental composition so he knew that quinine was made of carbon hydrogen oxygen and, and, and nitrogen and he wanted to synthesize this so that he could fulfill the needs that the population had for quinine now he knew that there was a chemical that could be found in the tar left behind when coal burned, and that was aniline. And aniline seemed to have a composition similar to quinine in terms of the carbons, the hydrogens, and the nitrogens, but it had no oxygen. So his idea was to take aniline and react it with an oxidizing agent, the chemical that would add oxygen, to convert it into quinine. Now, in retrospect, we know that this was a totally futile effort. They, know not, they knew nothing about molecular structure. Quinine is a very complicated molecule. They had no chance at all of synthesizing it in those days. Of course, such hindsight is easy. Today, we know about molecular structure. We know about chemical synthesis. They had no way of making it then. So it was not a bad idea to try to take something that had no oxygen in it and tried to add oxygen to it. In fact, the synthesis of quinine was only achieved by Robert Woodward, the greatest or synthetic organic chemist who ever lived at uh, Harvard University. And that was done in uh, 1944. This was not a commercially viable synthesis. This was only of academic interest. It contained hundreds of different steps. Even today, quinine cannot be synthesized. It is isolated still from the, uh, the bark of the tree. So anyway, Hoffman said to young Perkin, go home, take aniline, start adding some oxidizing agents to it, see if you can make quinine. Of course, he could not. He kept coming up with various kinds of tars and gums, and the biggest problem was washing out the glassware because there was all these sticky, gucky stuff. And one day, he couldn't wash out his flask with soap and water, so he tried rinsing it with alcohol. And he noticed something amazing. The sink into which he dumped this turned into a brilliant color. And this is the color that today we recognize as mauve. He had never seen anything like this. Now, again, I think many people would have said, hell, how do I clean this mess? But not Perkin. He recognized that he had made a discovery. He knew that he had made a synthetic dye. He was able to replicate this process. And in fact, he borrowed money from his father and founded a company, and he began to manufacture mauve. It became a very, very popular product. But there was a chance discovery here, too, because it turned out that the aniline that he had been using had been contaminated by another coal tar chemical called allyl toluidine. And this is what reacted with the oxidizing agent in order to make mauve. Had he used pure aniline, he would have never made this discovery. So anyway, he was able to manufacture large amounts. And the decade after the introduction of mauve is still known today as the mauve decade. It became a very popular, fashionable color. Even postage stamps at the time were colored mauve. And if anyone collects these penny royals, as they are called from England at the time in 1860s, look at the color. That color 
is the synthetic mold, the first ever synthetic coloring. Well, this of course launched the whole dye industry and uh, Perkin became the elder statesman of this industry. He retired uh, from lab work in the 1930s, having made a great deal of money and spent the rest of his time doing uh, research. Uh, he developed what is known as the Perkin reaction, which we teach the students in organic chemistry. And uh, there's even a Perkin medal in his honor that is given out every year in the United States to a top chemist. And it's a very interesting event when this medal is bestowed on someone. Uh, it traditionally takes place in restaurants, most of the time at Delmonico's in New York, a highly exclusive restaurant. And if you get an invitation to the Perkin dinner, in the invitation, you get a bow tie if you're a gentleman. And these days, ladies are invited too. They get a scarf. And this, both the bow tie and the scarf are colored with mauve taken from Perkin's original sample, believe it or not. Because when he came to the United States in 1906, the lecture at Columbia University, he left a sample of his original mauve. And every year, a little bit of this is taken out. It is used to color some silk, and that is used to make the bow ties and the scarves for the, for the Perkin uh, dinner. So uh, Perkin had a big role to play, of course, in the uh, synthetic dye industry. And it wasn't only mauve. I mean, if you could make mauve, you could make many other colors. And indeed, soon the industry was cranking up all sorts of, of dyes. Beautiful green, for example, advertised here, as you can see, malachite uh, uh, green, and many other colors as well. But of course, if you can make synthetic dyes, maybe you could make other synthetic substances too. And this gave birth to the pharmaceutical industry. Bayer, for example, started out as a dye company. They were making all kinds of dyes. And then discovered that, well, if you can do chemical reactions to make new synthetic dyes, maybe you can make other things. And aspirin was the first product, of course, of the Bayer company. Uh, contrary to many people's thoughts, uh, which has been instilled by uh, poor education, uh, or at least faulty education, Aspirin is not found in nature. It is not found in the bark of the willow tree. Even some textbooks say that. This is not the case. There's a compound in the bark of the willow tree called salicin. And salicin does have fever-reducing properties and, and anti-inflammatory uh, properties. And it has been used since, through, since the ages. Hippocrates recommended an extract of the bark of the willow tree for, for fever. The only trouble with it is that it also upsets the stomach a great deal. So the idea that Bayer had was to take the naturally occurring compound and modify it somehow in the lab. And that is what gave birth to aspirin. It is a synthetic modification of a compound that occurs in, in nature. And this, of course, is, is what made Bayer into the big company. It is a huge company. It is in Germany, in Leverkusen. And uh, the biggest neon sign in the world adorns the uh, uh, company there, as you, as you and see, and it's in the shape of a giant aspirin uh, tablet. Uh, there's even a, a football or a soccer team in, in Germany uh, that is owned by the Bayer company. Uh, it plays its home games in the uh, Bayer uh, arena. Although these days, of course, they're playing those games uh, in front of empty stadiums. But the German league uh, has already, in fact, started up. And they're wearing masks and they're playing in front of uh, empty stadiums. So as you can see, aspirin, uh, the synthesis of aspirin can be linked back to the accidental discovery that was made by, by Perkin. Aspirin was advertised by the Bayer company widely, interestingly enough, on the same bill as heroin, because in those days, heroin was judged to be a, a safe antitussive uh, against coughs. Of course, it turned out not to be the case. Also, it's interesting to note that in this particular ad, aspirin was advertised does not affect the heart. Whereas, of course, these days, one of the prime indications for the use of aspirin is to try to prevent uh, heart disease. So the dye industry was serendipitously discovered, and uh, aspirin can be linked back to that as well. Well, let's jump across the pond from uh, uh, Germany and England to North America and Johns Hopkins. University. 
where another serendipitous discovery was made, and that was saccharin. Saccharin is the world's first uh, non-nutritive sweetener. Uh, that is a sugar analog that doesn't give you calories so that you can use very little of it to get the same degree of sweetness. This was a lucky discovery. Dr. Ira Remsen was a researcher at Johns Hopkins University, and uh, he had uh, a, a Polish uh, uh, postdoctor fellow working under him by the name of Konstantin Falberg. And Remsen had given Falberg the task of uh, looking at the chemical reactions of toluene sulfonamide. This was a chemical, again, isolated from coal tar. Coal tar in those days was, was uh, one of the prime research uh, uh, substances because there's so many different chemicals that are found in, in the tar that is left behind when coal burns. And uh, he was given the task of seeing what you could do with toluene sulfonamide, what kind of reactions it would engage in. And one day, uh, he was having lunch in the laboratory, and he picked up his sandwich, not having washed his hands. In those days, uh, they were not very knowledgeable about cleanliness. In my, I mean, this, in fact, was before uh, you know hand washing became popular even in medical circles, thanks to Ignat Semmelweis. As so I was eating in the laboratory, and he found that his sandwich tasted sweet. Now, again, most people probably would not have paid all that much attention to that. But he was intrigued by the sweet taste. And he traced it to a chemical that he had synthesized from the toluene sulfonamide. Uh, and that sweet taste turned out to be saccharin. And it became, of course, a huge commercial success. The company that first marketed saccharin was the Monsanto company. And often people are surprised to hear this because, of course, these days they associate Monsanto with agricultural chemicals and genetic modified crops. But Monsanto uh, originally was a chemical company, and its first main product was saccharin. And the Monsanto company is actually was named after the maiden name of the uh, company's wife, uh, who was Italian. So saccharin was an accident of discovery. In 1965, aspartame was also an accident of discovery. Jim Schlatter at the G.D. Searle company, that was a pharmaceutical company, was doing research on gastric ulcers. And once again, he had the habit of eating in the lab, something that we don't do these days, of course, but uh, it was quite common back then. And once again, he picked up food that he had been eating. He found the sweet taste. He traced it to the research that he had been doing and discovered that it was uh, a chemical that eventually was isolated as aspartame, uh, came to be known as NutraSweet, and it is far sweeter than sugar. So you need very little of this chemical in order to have the same degree of sweetness. Uh, these artificial sweeteners, of course, also have some controversy surrounding them. Uh, there have been stories about uh, uh, saccharin link being linked to cancer. It turns out that that is, is not the case. Uh, aspartame has also been accused of this, uh, but there is no uh, sound science to, to back that up. On the other hand, I, I'm not a great fan of these artificial sweeteners because they don't do what they are supposed to do, that is make people lose weight. It turns out that since uh, artificial sweeteners have been introduced, uh, the average weight of the North American public has gone up. Why is that? Oh, I, I think uh, partly because someone will put an artificial sweetener into their coffee and then they'll be so happy that they have done that, that they'll reward themselves by having that piece of cake that they would not have had had they put sugar into their coffee and the cake has more calories than the sugar would have had in, 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 in the coffee. But anyway, I, I don't think that there's any safety issue with these sweeteners. Uh, on the other hand, uh, they don't do what they are supposed to do. <clears throat> Viagra, one of the most famous drugs that has ever been introduced, believe it or not, also based upon a serendipitous observation. Uh, Viagra was first introduced as a treatment for angina. Uh, angina occurs when the coronary arteries uh, are partially blocked and when people exert themselves, uh, the heart 
because of the artery being constricted and uh, this causes pain. And uh, there are drugs that uh, can alleviate those symptoms. Nitroglycerin, of course, is the classic one, but there are others too. And Viagra, uh, sildenafil, was the drug that was uh, introduced uh, with hopes of, of being an effective treatment. Well, it turned out that it was not very effective against angina, but men who were taking this drug noticed an unexpected effect. Uh, they noticed that um, they became more manly when they were taking the, uh, the drug. And this came to the uh, attention of Pfizer, which was the manufacturer. And of course, they were able to capitalize on this. And uh, this has now become uh, one of the most uh, profitable drugs in history. Uh, it, of course, is sold for erectile dysfunction. And it is a drug that actually does work. Obviously, it doesn't work in everyone. No drug works in everyone. But you can see that it all came out of this uh, interesting chance discovery. Well, there's one other area that I want to mention to you as we're talking about you know, lucky uh, discoveries. And this is uh, something that we refer to as Mount Everest science. What does that mean? What is Mount Everest science? Why do people count, climb Mount Everest? They climb it because it's there. And this idea also holds in science. You do some research just to see what may happen. And this is what we call non-goal-oriented research. There are two kinds of, of scientific research. There's the goal-oriented research where you have a problem that you're trying to solve. Right now, of course, we have the problem of COVID-19 uh, and everyone in the world <laughs> is working on trying to find a, a way to, to treat the disease or to develop a vaccine. This is goal-oriented research where you know exactly what your goal is and you're trying to get there. But there's also something else that we call basic or fundamental research that is not goal-oriented, that you do just because no one has ever done this before. And it isn't because you think it's going to lead to anything specific. Uh, it's just to, to, to try to unravel the mysteries of nature. So I'll give you an interesting example of this. Back in 1938, Isidore Rabi at Columbia University published a paper called The New Method of Measuring Nuclear Magnetic Moment. The proton is a fundamental particle. Uh, it is the nucleus of the hydrogen atom. Hydrogen atom is the smallest atom that, that exists, and its nucleus consists of just a proton. Well, this proton acts as a tiny little magnet. It has what is called a, a, a nuclear magnetic moment, and this is something that Rabi was studying purely out of academic interest, not looking for a solution to any kind of a, a problem. And he published uh, a paper in physical reviews, which I think was not understandable by anyone, except people who are working in this very, very narrow area of looking at magnetic moments of, of nuclei. Well, two researchers, who were indeed in that area, physicists, Felix Bloch at Stanford and Edward Purcell at Harvard, came across Rabi's paper and investigated it a little bit further and found that there was a somewhat practical use to which this could be put. They also published a, a, a number of uh, papers on this, on this nuclear magnetic moment. And out of these papers came the realization that the protons, the nuclei of hydrogen atoms that were in different positions in a molecule, like organic compounds have all kinds of hydrogens in them, that they were able to give a different kind of signal when stimulated by an external radio frequency. Now that we don't need to get into the details of, of this, but the point of this was that based upon the work of these two researchers who were stimulated by uh, uh, the original work of, of Rabi, organic chemists were able to put this technology to use to determine molecular structure. So for example, they found that uh, a sample of ethanol would give rise to a particular kind of graph when, when the 
molecules were, were uh, introduced into a magnetic field, it radiated with a certain radio frequency, and uh, an instrument was designed to, to measure what the result of this interaction was. And this gave rise to, to a method of elucidating molecular structure. By the 1960s, instruments had been developed called nuclear magnetic resonance spectrometers. By 1970s, we even had these in student labs. Students were able to use these, and they were able to look at the graphs that were produced by these instruments and determine molecular structure. And as I told you, back in the 1800s, when mystery of quinine was trying to be solved, they had no idea of what molecular structure was. Well, as you can see, by, by the 1900s, it became relatively easy based upon observations such as this to know exactly how bonding occurred in molecules and to determine molecular structure. Now, of course, the originators <laughs> of, of uh, the magnetic resonance studies, the Rabi and Bloch and Purcell, had no idea of organic chemistry. They had no idea where their discoveries, their calculations would lead but eventually they led to structural analysis. Well, then came a very interesting observation. Once uh, structural analysis was well-founded, and here you're looking at one of the, the more modern uh, uh, spectrometers. This uses a very powerful helium, liquid helium-cooled magnet. This is what it looks like. This is what we use now. And when this came into common use, and, and it was obvious that it could be used to determine molecular structures, Raymond Damadian had another idea. He knew that living tissues, of course, were made of organic compounds, and organic compounds had hydrogens all over the place. So he wondered what would happen if instead of just using a sample of an organic compound in a spectrometer, you used an animal. So, for example, the tail of a mouse would be put in between the poles of the magnet, surrounded by a radio frequency uh, oscillator, and uh, he wanted to see just what kind of information this would reveal. Well, pretty soon, uh, he was looking at other animals, a rather unique kind of CAT scan. He was developing machines that could basically look into people. And yeah, he basically developed a theory of, of the modern magnetic resonance imager. Uh, he deserves a lot of credit for this. He developed some amazing uh, uh, machines, all based upon this idea that, that protons in different environments behave differently when they're exposed to magnetic fields and radio frequencies. But it was uh, Peter Mansfield and Paul Lauterbur who really put this all together. Uh, although the Median had the original idea of, of, of these body scanners, he was never able to really make it work and to, to use it in a practical way. But Mansfield and Lauterbur were able to do it, and they eventually got the Nobel Prize for what, of course, we now know as magnetic resonance imaging. The Median was excluded from that Nobel Prize, and that has been very, very controversial uh, because many people think that he should have been included as a third party because he really made the original observations. Anyway, this is very controversial business. But the Nobel Prize in Medicine and Physiology went to Lauterberg and Mansfield in 2003. But I think probably it should have included uh, the Median uh, as well, because without his observations, these two probably would not have achieved the same kind of, of, of results. Well, pretty soon, because of Mansfield and, and Lauterberg's efforts, uh, real human scanners were built that gave images. And this is, uh, this is an idea that the Median had launched, but he was never able to bring it to fruition. But these guys were able to bring it to fruition. And now you can take someone, you put them inside of a uh, magnetic resonance imager, MRI. The name has been changed. It used to be called nuclear magnetic resonance imaging, but people were so scared of the term nuclear, they thought they would become radioactive. So, so it was changed to MRI imaging. And MRI imagers today are widely used in, in hospitals. They're probably the best uh, tool for looking inside the human body. You get amazing images. You, you can get a picture of the inside of the human body. And it is not invasive. It's not like x-rays. You're not exposing the patient to any kind of, of uh, 
damaging radiation. The only thing that you're using is radio frequency. This is a non-ionizing form of radiation. It cannot break molecules apart, so it doesn't cause any harm. So here we are. We see this fantastic instrument, the magnetic resonance imager, that can be traced back to research done that had absolutely nothing to do with this. It was just because Rabi at one time was interested in finding what happens to nuclei when you put them in between a magnetic field. And had he not been given research grants to do that, we would not have had uh, MRI. Uh, so this is just a little plea for fundamental research because you never know where it's going to lead. And of course, there was the chance discovery here that some organic chemist happened to read those papers and physical reviews and uh, had the idea that this might be used in, in organic structural analysis. And the median had the idea that this could be used to peer into the body. And this is indeed how science progresses. And uh, it is all coming down to making an observation and coming to an appropriate conclusion based upon that observation. And we can't finish a talk like this, of course, without talking about Isaac Newton and his fabled accidental discovery. Well, what is that fable? Isaac Newton, way back in the 17th century, uh, of course, came up with the theory of gravity and his three laws of motion. Uh, the third law, of course, many people are familiar with for every action, equal and opposite reaction which is really the fundamental tenets of, of, of uh, space travel, of, of, of rocketry. But the interesting story about Isaac Newton, of course, is that he came up with the theory of gravity after watching an apple fall. And this supposedly is the tree right next to the house that Newton lived in where he saw the apple fall. Well, where does serendipity come in? It's a very interesting story and particularly relevant these days with the coronavirus. Uh, Newton was a youngster and uh, he was in school. He was at university, he was at Cambridge, but the plague had struck. So the school was closed down so that people could go home and self-isolate because they understood that the plague could be transmitted. So it was while he was at home in self-isolation that he was sitting out in the backyard and he saw the apple fall from the tree. And that really did happen because he recounted this story in his memoirs. Now, of course, it didn't fall on his head. That's an apocryphal story, but he did watch the apple fall. And uh, this is what launched the theory of gravity. And he came up with the idea that the same force that attracted that apple to the ground was the force that kept the moon circling about the earth and he formulated his laws of uh, of motion so there was a serendipitous discovery here as well uh, because he would not have been home sitting in the backyard watching the apple fall had it not been for the fact that the plague had struck and the university had uh, closed down to his credit though uh, Newton uh, never said that uh, uh, the discovery was his alone. Uh, when asked how he had made so many important discoveries, he said it is because he had stood on the shoulders of giants. And indeed, that is the case with science. Uh, you have to make an observation, which many people may make, but they may come to alternate conclusions. Right? Well, Newton came to the right conclusion. Uh, the chance favored his prepared mind. The chance was the apple falling from the tree. He noticed that, but his mind was prepared to know what to do with this. So there are a lot of ideas out there in science that have come about through an accidental discovery. And I've mentioned just a few of these uh, to you to give you a little bit of insight how science works. Sometimes, of course, great stuff comes out of goal-oriented research. But very often, big discoveries are made either based on a good dose of luck or through what we call non-goal-oriented or Mount Everest kind of research. These are the kind of stories that uh, I like to deal with. And uh, of course, there are more of these on, on our website. Uh, you can go to mcgill.ca/oss. Uh, 
Uh, you can also find us on Facebook. We have a Facebook page. Uh, I have my own personal Facebook page. And of course, we have a Twitter uh, account as well. And uh, if you have any questions, I'd certainly be happy to, to try to answer them. And uh, I remind you also that, that we do have a program every Thursday through our office uh, called uh, OSS Discussions of COVID-19 Plus More, where we discuss current happenings in the COVID era, plus whatever else interesting science comes up. And if you check our website, you will always know what time that uh, discussion will take place. But it is recorded, so you can always look at it later, just like this uh, presentation is. So thanks very much for uh, your attention. And if anyone does have any questions out there, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Hello, Dr. Joe. Thank you again so much for the uh, very, very interesting presentation. I'm looking at the time now. I don't think we're gonna actually have a chance to answer any questions live, but I will make sure to take note of them and I will send them your way uh, so that way if you want to reach out to them personally uh, but once again thank you so much for joining us today especially on such a beautiful day uh, thank you to everyone that joined us today for it um, i know sometimes on a beautiful day like this it's kind of hard to say which one you want so hopefully a lot of you were able to enjoy dr joe's uh presentation outside in the sun and i'm also just going to reiterate again that uh, every thursday dr joe has um uh, uh, another live webinar with the OSS that you can check them out on their Facebook page and on their YouTube channel. And uh, once again, thank you so much, Dr. Joe. I really do appreciate you joining us again today. And I look forward to the next one that we have, whenever that might be. Thank you. And, and I'm happy to answer questions through email. And it's the uh, classic McGill email. It's joe, J-O-E dot S-C-H-W-A-R-C-Z at McGill dot C-A. And if you have any questions about this or anything else, uh, happy to answer it. Excellent. And like I said, I'll take note of any ones that come in and I will forward them to you with some of the, the contact info if I'm able to get that as well. And uh, thank you. I guess this is for like the fifth time as well. Thank okay. you again. <laughs> and I look, forward, uh, I look forward to next time. Okay. At least we can satisfy some curiosity in this new world that we're living in. Exactly. Bye. So have have a great rest of the day, Dr. Joe, and thank you, everyone. Bye. Have a great rest of the day.